Um, so I'm going to talk about, I guess, what is one 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 small portion of that uh, um, compilation that that Rick's been uh, talking about. So that was very much an overview. Um, but I'm, I'm going to talk about the Deposit Atlas, the Northwest Queensland uh, Mineral Deposit Atlas, and the uh, and the 3D compilation. Um, and, and how this sort of fits in, into the scheme is, and we saw at the end there, Rick was, was giving a bit of an overview of the, um, the Digital Earth Project that's being run by Steve Micklethwaite. And I guess the, the 3D compilation that we've been doing of, of all the different, um, of many of the different mineral deposits is actually that data that the compilation phase happened during the deposit atlas phase, and it's now being taken into that, um, in, into that Digital Earth uh, Project. So um, firstly, I guess I wanted to thank um, the GSQ A for having us here and B for, uh, for funding this work because it's been a, a fantastic, I've, I've really enjoyed, enjoyed working on it because Northwest Queensland is one of those sensational places in, in, in the globe where you have so many different styles of mineral deposits and such an, uh, uh, you know, large size of deposits are really, really world class. And, um, and I, I guess I would just note that it's, it's, um, it's not just me, it's myself, um, Rick, Nathan Fox and Mark Hinman have, have done all, all components of this um, deposit atlas, as well as various people from the GSQ and uh, SMI. And also the um, uh, so many mining companies who've, who've helped us out with data and, and knowledge and, and information. So thanks to all of those. Um, so the mineral deposit um, atlas, we covered um, 28 deposits. Um, of which I guess I'd rate five as, as really world class, and we'll have a look at them um, shortly. Um, and they were discovered between about 1882 to 2006, so, so a pretty long um, discovery, discovery history. Um, the, the metals that we see here in, in northwest Queensland, you'll see they, they cover a, a wide, well, not just metals, you also have phosphate uh, as well, but they cover a wide variety of, of, um, of different commodities. So there are the 28 um, deposits. Um, I, I'm, I'm just running through this briefly because I, I know I've, I've certainly spoken about this atlas before at, at various workshops, but in, in having a look at the participant list for this week, I noticed that there were quite a few names that, that I hadn't seen before. So I'll just briefly run through uh, Rick's, I guess, given the philosophy behind, behind the atlas and these compilations we're doing, but I just thought I'd run, run through sort of what, what, what we did very briefly. And that was to, to essentially try and track down all that data that is sitting out there and there is, there is so much of it that's, that's happened, particularly since about the 1990s or 1990 itself, actually, as we saw from Helen's diagram right at the start of the morning. So we, um, we, we went seeking data, we approached a lot of project owners, and, and it, was, it was quite encouraging to see that, that people, I think there's a general loosening up of people's attitudes to, to confidentiality of their own data these days. And, and um, we see that in, in so many of these deposits, people profit us up their, their drill database, in fact, to, to have a look at so that we could, we could really get a handle on the deposit. And, uh, you know, you'll see here, for example, all the ore shells from, uh, from Osborne were provided to us along with a lot of other deposits, et cetera. So I really wanted to thank those project owners for being so open with, with their data. That was fantastic. Uh, historic research, um, you know, you'll, you'll see all these sorts of things from the... the, the the, the Predictive Mineral Discovery Cooperative Research Centre, JCU, uh, CSIRO, there's been so much research went on and it was all sit, sitting out there waiting, waiting to be compiled. Um, public material, published papers, uh, and, and even stock exchange releases and websites. So, so particularly for some of the smaller deposits that may have, for example, changed owner regularly, but, um, and, and with, with junior companies, there's, there's a lot of information out there in their public press releases, et cetera. So we, we really did, did a, a, a strong search. And of course, the government databases were a major contributor um, from GSQ, Geoscience Australia. Um, you know, Ausgen, um, so, so so much data out there. So so we really went hard to try and get all that data together. Um, so so the the deposit atlases that they're, they're based around deposits themselves. A couple of them we put together. For example, um, Century and Gravilia, um, because because Gravilia is, is is a somewhat similar type of uh, type of deposit. Uh, it, it, didn't have a lot of information, so we thought we'd cluster it with with Century, for example. So each each one of those um, one of those chapters, we tried to get the regional data sets together. And up here in Northwest Queensland, there are are a lot of regional data sets. We we saw, for example, the the high res mag available, um, and and there's a lot of stuff. I think this might be um, 
even, even some high map data that's been flown up here over the years. So we tried to get the regional data sets together and we put them all, all in, in, within each chapter, put them all at the same scale, uh, covering the same area so that you can, you can look and say, well, what does this area look like in the mag, in the gravity, um, what's the radiometrics, uh, what's the geology, the mineral occurrence distribution, so that you can, you can compare all those data sets really, really easily. Um, and so you'll see these, these uh, maps, and, and this is how they appear in the reports, and I'll talk a little bit later. So there's two components. One is the report, and two is the 3D model. And then as well as, as, well as the regional data sets, we also put together deposit scale data sets, obviously, and um, I, I put this diagram up because one of the key objectives is, and this is, a, this is some data from a fantastic thesis done by Neil Adshead at uh, Osborne back in the 90s, I think. And this is his, um, he, he did some oxygen isotope uh, work on, on quartz and magnetite um, separates. And, and this is what you see when you read, you read the thesis. There are a few sections that sort of highlight it a little bit. But what we wanted to do was take that, that data and put it in something that is much more um, spatially contextual. So, for example, this is this is the Osborne Open Pit. This is the uh, Osborne ore bodies, and this is where all of this data actually sits in in real space. So, for example, I'm not sure what this is, but you know, it, it might be the calculated fluid fluid oxygen isotope values from the quartz magnetite separates. I'm not sure what it is, but it's basically allowing you to say, well, can we track changes throughout that ore body in a spatial context. So that, that was one of the key, key drivers that we were, were, were looking at was, was to put all of that historic data that looks like this in tables into something that will actually allow you to, to make some spatial judgments. Um, this is the 28 deposits that, um, that we looked at um, and I'll put them in chronological order here from, from gunpowder, uh, Mount Gordon, Capricorn, copper back in 1882 all the way to at this stage uh, Rocklands in 2006 was was the most recent discovery that we included in the in the atlas um, so I know my, a lot of people are familiar with the the 3d compilations that we put together but I thought I would just whip up a few of the data sets just to give you an idea of, of what's in there because it's, um, we've put it all together and it's up on the web, et cetera, but, but I know that a, a lot of people may not have, have installed Geoscience Analyst or, or downloaded the data and, and opened them up, um, which is, I guess, part of the driver behind UD Stream that Rick was showing, is to make it a lot more easily accessible. But I thought I would show you some of the data sets anyway. So what, what we have is, uh, is 3D geology where we're available for most of the uh, deposits. And for example, here you'll see the, uh, the sea base uh, data set coloured here, some of the seismic sections, and in this case, it's it's the the faults from the the 3D geological model, which I think in this case was the Northwest Queensland 2010 model that was was put together, and and we found that to be a very consistent model. It has faults, stratigraphy, and and granites in it, um, so we've used that as our base geology. Um, the ore body geometry, as I was saying, many, many of the um, operation project owners were provided a lot of data. So all, all of these projects or, or most of them have, have a, a fair indication whether it's constructed from sections by ourselves or whether it was provided by the project owners of what those, what those geometries look like for the various ore bodies, which is, is, is incredibly um, interesting. So I'd say definitely go and have a look at that. Uh, potential field data we've included where possible. Um, We've, we've taken a lot of this, this old data. So, so this is, for example, the Osborne deposit again. And this is some data from um, one, of the, one of the original discovery papers so that you can see what the data looked like using those technologies uh, back when that was discovered. And then we've also included where possible new, new public domain data sets. For example, this is the Falcon Airborne Gravity uh, over Osborne and the, the TMI, et cetera. Um, geophysics, we've also included, included EM data where possible. And this is, this is, this is the Walford Creek model. And I'd, I'd urge you to go and have a look at it because it's, it's positively um, fascinating. So this was the early work by uh, WMC with ground, um, ground EM data. Uh, and you basically have a shallow pyrite lens deepening up. And then this was a 1998 Tempest survey. 
Um, and and this, is, this is the conductivity isosurface, which it pretty much is smack bang correlates with this, this pyrite lens. So it's, it's a great, great case study. Um, the, this, we've included uh, geochemistry where possible. We've taken a lot from the, the geochemist uh, toolkit uh, from those appendices. Uh, and we've put that data in, into 3D uh, where available. So for example, this is the, the Tick Hill um, deposit. Uh, the high logger, we've included that where available. There's a, there's a, a large collection that uh, GSQ has, has run through their high logger, a lot of core, et cetera. So this example is from Cannington. Um, so in, in the 3D models where we've, we've um, pulled in the, the line scan imagery of the drill core where available, and also the, um, the indicative mineralogy, for example, from, from the high logger. So that's, that's all sitting in there. Um, some other data sets that, that aren't available everywhere, but, um, but have, have been compiled. This is, this is the Mount Isa copper and um, zinc lead silver systems. So this is the, uh, the Delta O18 map at surface. Um, and, and I think the one over there is the, um, is the RAB geochemistry or the surface geochemistry through the Isa Valley. So, so all of this data is, is in, the, in the reports as well as in the 3D models. Um, We've pulled in a whole bunch of CSIRO data. This is the TEMA, TEMA imagery. So this, this, this is, is mineral mapping essentially that happens, happens on, on small cuts that are about one and a half centimetres in diameter. Um, and there, there were so many of these collected by CSIRO as part of their un un Uncover Cloncurry project. So we've pulled them in and, um, and Rick was showing you the seismic, sorry, the tomographic imagery from uh, Ernest Henry. And, and this TEMA imagery likewise has been imported so that you can actually see the mineralogy and the core photos down the drill holes and where they sit within these deposits. So it's a, it's a fascinating res resource if you get time to sit down and, uh, and, and have a look at it, which you should make time for. Um, one, one last data set I just wanted to talk about, and this was collected by um, CSIRO, James Austin. And he's, uh, he did a whole bunch of work looking at uh, magnetic susceptibility and remnant uh, susceptibility in the petrophysical properties of, of various uh, ISCG deposits around Cloncurry. So we've pulled that data in where uh, possible as well. Um, so just to, just to let everybody know where, where you can um, find this, and I'm sure it's referenced in the PDF that, that um, Rick has put together. Um, so you should be able to find it. It's a hard copy PDF atlas that you can download and it's, it's very easy read. Um, you, you can see all the diagrams. We're very much focused on, uh, on maps rather than text so much. And then there's the 3D compilation and model. So that's, that's available from a couple of places, the um, GSQ open data portal, as well as the, uh, the SMI website. So if, if you go there, you can see all the different, uh, different deposits. So I think that's about it within the 20 minutes. So this is the two, two links to the SMI page or the, um, the GSQ data portal. Okay, so thanks, thanks for that. Did you get, was that 10 minutes? Up. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Yeah. And, and look, I, I, it, we, we ran the um, drill core workshop yesterday and it, it was fantastic to be able to put all of this contextual information together with that, um, that, that core collection that the GSQ has put together. I was just saying to Vlad, sort of anybody has a spare weekend, you can come up and you can, you can have a look at that. You can organize to get that core out and, and have a look at it yourself. You don't need to wait for the workshops to come up or anything like that. So it's fantastic. So congratulations. Thanks, Paul. I'll just there was also there was a comment online from Richard um, that the geoscience analyst has is now working on getting a whole bunch of geo uh, Python code, the, the GeoPy five, I think it is, uh, into as well. So that'll enable a whole bunch of ingest and analytical work as well to be done. So um, I know they've just enabled SegWi data in the, the geoscience analyst program as well. So they're constantly developing it, um, but they've got a whole bunch of Python libraries coming in as well now. So um, yeah. hopefully we'll be able to use the deposit atlases to do some further analysis integration of, of some other data sets as well into the future. Yeah, no, yeah fantastic. And, and uh, 
I should, I should mention that we've done this in Geoscience Analyst and, and, and partly why that is is because Geoscience Analyst uh, not only is it, is it very useful and deals with a lot of different data formats, but it also has a, a viewer that you can, you can download um, essentially free of charge from, from Myra, the Myra website, um, so, that, so that you don't have to actually purchase software. You just need to download and register. So it's, uh, it's available to everybody. I just I just wanted to mention one thing as well, and that was okay, I think in Joe's talk and in Paul's talk, the the stable isotopes for the Mount Isa ore body came up, and uh, Ben Andrew has just recently finished his uh, finished his PhD thesis and is actually working for MIM or for for Glencore, and um, and as part of his thesis, he made surfaces available for for Del 18O and Del 13C, and and the Mount Isa. Geoscience Analyst Atlas at long last has finally gone up and includes all those 3D contours as well, which really demonstrate the sort of isotopic um, uh, gradient around the Mount Isocopolar bodies. So, so well worth having a look. That's great.